Hello, everyone. Welcome to this first of two virtual artist talks for the second Craft Invitational, an exhibition at the Dubuque Museum of Art through October 11th, 2020. For those attending live today, you can submit questions in the Q&A, and please do submit the questions. We will probably have some time at the end, but we may answer questions throughout the talk. I'm joined by my colleague, Kay Schrader, who's assisting with those questions and with some technical management, getting our last panelist on board here today. My name is Stacy Gage Peterson. I'm the curator and registrar at the Dubuque Museum of Art and your host for this talk. I'll give a brief description of the exhibition, um, then introduce our artists joining us today, and then we'll hear from them. But first, I have a few important acknowledgments. The Duma Craft Invitational would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors, Premier Bank, Cottingham and Butler, Mosaic Lodge number 125, Wisconsin Public Radio, and Brigadier General USA retired Bob and Nancy Felderman. I also wanna express my gratitude and acknowledge the efforts of our curatorial team, Dolores Fortuna, Maureen Bardusk, Paul Opperman, and Carol Spellich. Their insights into the regional craft communi community and their volunteer time made this exhibition a reality. So about the Duma Craft Invitational. For those that don't know, this exhibition highlights fine craft with an emphasis on traditional materials handled in unexpected and innovative ways. The exhibition includes over 70 works by a select group of regionally based craftspeople working in ceramic, glass, wood, paper, and metal. The artists in this exhibition are transforming basic familiar materials into complex, insightful works of art. In the process, they are not only keeping traditional craft techniques alive, they are blazing new technical and creative paths for future craft artists. And I'm honored to welcome and be joined today by three of our craft artists. Born and raised in Iowa, Darlis Ewalt received her BFA from Drake and MFA from Indiana University. She's a metal artist and art instructor in Chicago. Her four works in the exhibition, two vessel forms and two teapot forms, like works by several artists in the exhibition, often surprise the viewer with the revelation of their material, and in Darlis' case, that they are indeed metal. The contemplation of material, form, and color are important aspects of her work. Allie Kaus is a jewelry designer from Spring Green, Wisconsin. She received her BFA in metalsmithing from Arizona State University. Her seed necklace in the exhibition pushes the boundaries of what is considered beautiful adornment, elevating the status of seeds and expressing her passion for the earth and our connection to it. Also from Spring Green is artist Linda Kellen. Linda attended the School of the Art Institute and Haystack Mountain School of Crafts. Her artistic repertoire includes painting, printmaking, notably woodcuts, and metalwork, specifically chasing and repoussé. Her 12 metal spoons in the exhibition delight with a mix of playful and profound observations. Before we jump to the work in the exhibition, Let's begin, if we can, with each of you telling us a little bit about yourself and how you came to your craft. And Darlis, if you are ready, would you start us off? Okay, um, uh, I grew up in rural Iowa, so there were lots of uh, long nights during the winter where my mother and I would just sit around the dining room table and make things. So I just had this love of making things from a very early age. And I always knew I wanted to be an artist. Um, and I went to uh, Drake University uh, for college. Had no idea anything like making jewelry existed. So that was my first foray into it. I took a class and I just fell in love with working with metal as a material. Uh, so I worked as a commercial jeweler for a couple of years before I went on to uh, graduate school. And in graduate school, I was uh, introduced to more sculptural forms um, in metal. And so uh, now I, I 
do a little bit of jewelry, but I'm mostly working in sculpture forms. Great. Thank you, Darlis. Allie, are you ready? Yep. <laughs> Great. Okay, so I grew up in um, the Sonoran Desert, Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, in a pretty creative family, but did not really have an intention to be an artist. I actually found the metal smithing studio through the process of elimination. Um, but when I did find it, it was definitely, it felt like coming home. I love the way that jewelry has the ability to communicate on multiple levels. And the intimacy really spoke to me on how it can connect. Uh, it you know, connects someone to themselves, but it also connects to another person because of that communication. And uh, silver is my main metal and I metal in general. I'm very drawn to how solid metal is, but also how it's malleable under the right conditions. And to me, that speaks of us as humans, you know, of our ability to change and um, take different forms with the, with the right applications. Great, great. Thank you. Linda, are you ah. able to join us? Question is what, how did I get involved in this? Just a little bit more about yourself if you, if, if you want, and then yeah, how you came to your craft. It started a long time ago. I, you know, it's really hard to explain. My dad was very creative. He was an inventor. Um, I was supposed to be John just because I was the first one and a girl it didn't stop him. And so I, we went into foundries and factories and he had printing presses in the basement because of this weird job that he had. And I wound up going to the Art Institute when I was a kid all the way through from about fourth grade because I thought there was something wrong with me and I'd find more people like me there, but you know, it's hard to say. I'll try anything, just if it looks like it's fun, if I'm gonna learn something or I'm gonna make a whole bunch of money at it. And that's how I sort of got through all this. And as far as the metal goes, um, it was around, I had to hang a walkie talkie up and I found some aluminum flashing and I bent it around and then I started messing with that. And the first stuff I was doing is moving aluminum flashing with clothespins. And I, sh I did, um, I sh took a picture of like a guy with a big beer bottle that was done with clothespins on aluminum flashing. And somebody came over, he was a blacksmithing friend of mine. He came back a few, probably a week later. He said, here, you need these for chasing and repose. And he gave me three tools. And I moved from clothespins to these three tools. And then I bought a set of tools from a guy in, in Argentina. And that was my first set of tools because I was working for um, a jeweler in town. And I, because they were working small, I thought I'd get little tools because I'll have little tiny pieces of metal. And then I got bigger tools. I wound up getting like a scholarship at Haystack. So that taught me how to make my own tools in the craft department. And I'm just, I'm all, I draw pictures. I was illustrating. I make signs. I used to love to make signs for butcher shops. Um, you know, and I'm still sort of going. I'll try this, that. I used aluminum because it was easy and cheap. And I learned how to anneal it. And I do a lot of stuff with aluminum. I do copper. Um, and then I'm making friends with sterling silver now. It's really much harder than aluminum. I mean, than, uh, than the copper stuff. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm game. I'm, I'll try it. I'm not going to retire. I'm just going to keep going. Well, good. And I paint and I carve wood and I make prints and I've got a 300 year old etching press here. When I get into etching and dry points, I can do that. And what else? I carve wood, little heads and sculptures and stuff. I make boxes. I do all kinds of stuff. So that's what I do. You hop around to different mediums. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, this one may stu if you would come in here, you'd think it was sort of chaotic unless you s took the time to understand that all this over here is metal. The stuff in the middle is usually for painting. The stuff near the sink is usually for my printing woodblock prints. Um, 
and upstairs is, I have all of my books upstairs. I have so many books. Uh, Self-taught, absolutely. I love learning stuff. I mean, I'm seriously creative. I mean, curious, not so much. The creative comes because you're curious. You're gonna have to fix something or make something or try something and make enormous numbers of mistakes. That's how I learn stuff. And that's it. Yep. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. So let's move on to the work, the work in the exhibition. Um, I have re images for reference. And again, I think we'll start with Darlis. And I'm going to go to your work here. Darlis, do you want to tell us about your work? Okay, um, these are uh, a couple of teapots. Uh, I've made a number of them uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, they're not functional, but I was just playing with the form. And they're all based on drawings of birds um, that I've done. And uh, I did these two, uh, I started them last year when fires were raging in Australia. Um, Cause I had the opportunity to be in Australia on several occasions to uh, teach workshops and you know, I just love all the birds in that country and the people were so lovely and I have friends there and I, it was just a way to sort of commemorate uh, my time there and my sadness of what was happening. And uh, so these are uh, uh, hammered and constructed from uh, sheet metal. Um, these are from um, a metal called red brass. So it uh, has a little more copper in it, so it makes it a little softer to hammer and form. But every hard edge on these is a, a seam, so it's lots of parts put together. And the colors on my pieces are all done uh, with chemicals, so it's a chemical patina process. Yeah, the, I love the, those brilliant colors. Those definitely are the signature of your work, I think. And uh, these two are um, from another series I've been doing about the last two years called Chrysalis. Uh, so um, yeah, they're based on butterfly chrys chrysalis. Um, and it's, to me, that form, it's kind of like a, a form of hope and rebirth. Um, so I've just kind of really liked, you know, playing just with the grace and beauty of that form a lot. And again, you know, working with the different colors and nuances um, on the pieces too. Before we go to the next slide, what about between these two, there seems to be like they're pairs, they work together. Were they created to go together? Um, I, I often work in a series form, so I work on more than one piece at the same time. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they, they're more of, of a similar idea that I've just kind of, ex, you know, um, investigated in different ways. And it's just kind of how I work. There's your studio. This is my studio. This is actually clean. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not always like that. Um, but uh, you can kind of see the tools that I use. Uh, as I said, I do a lot of um, uh, hand hammering um, and, um, you know, just a you know, so I make a lot of noise. And uh, this is a process that uh, a lot of the work starts off as, uh, as so uh, these are copper. And this was flat sheet. Um, this is a process called angle raising. So it's holding a piece of metal at a certain angle um, on a, a metal form, and you're slowly bringing the form up. So it's a process, it's a traditional metal smithing process, but uh, it's also a very long process, but it's very meditative. It's one of my very favorite things to do is to hammer on metal. And then, uh, yeah, so these are actually both of the teapots that uh, are in the show in process. So these are soldering the parts together. Uh, so you see all this white on here is solder that gets filed and, and ground away. Uh, so you can just kind of see the, 
multiple parts um, on each one. Um, so they take a long time to fabricate, you know, too. But then they, I don't design something completely before I start. They kind of, I start with some drawings, uh, but they evolve as, as I'm working, which makes things much easier or more interesting to me, you know, too. So these are the teapots in the exhibition? Yes, they are. Process, okay. I just zoomed in on them a little so you could get a closer look. Here's my torch, yes. <laughs> so what's happening? So these are joined by um, silver soldering. So um, it's not quite like welding or it's more like brazing where you're adding another material that flows in a seam uh, that joins the parts together. Go to the next one. And uh, this is uh, going through the patina or coloration process. Uh, so it's a lot of alchemy. So I don't always, even though there, I might have a recipe or formula for um, a patina, it, depending on the weather and how it's applied or whatever, it might be a little bit different. Um, so I heat the piece when it's all finished and then I apply chemicals um, with the brush um, and it's done in layers. So the different chemicals react with each other and with the metal to form the color. And these brighter colors do have special dyes that might be added to the chemical patinas to kind of really push it towards these very bright colors. And then they're sealed with a lacquer afterwards. So I'm just checking if we have any other questions for you. I had one describing the process of developing a patina. Actually, uh, there are recipe books on, on patinas. That it's a very traditional thing that's been done for years and years. Uh, so you're probably, you know, looking at the Statue of Liberty, that green is a patina. Um, a patina will happen naturally on copper if it's left outside. But um, there are just different chemicals and depending on the chemicals, uh, you mix them together uh, with distilled water. Um, and um, I use all hot patinas, which means the piece has to be hot um, for the patina to happen. Uh, so I see the color happen right away. So I heat the piece of metal and then touch the metal with the brush that's laden with the chemicals and I will see the color. Um, and as I said, they're done in layers. So um, so usually they're a light green to begin with, and then I'm putting other layers on top that will give me a wider range here too. Okay, great, thank you. Allie, would you like to talk about your work in the exhibition? Sure, great. yeah. Um, and I just wanna say with Darlis, I can, I can attest to the slow meditative process because I learned how to do that raising as well. Um, so it is fascinating. It's such a beautiful technique, um, but it is slow going. Um, so this is an older piece of mine. And I had mentioned that I grew up in the desert. So um, I have been in the Midwest for about 10 years. And I was just amazed at um, the ability to grow things is very different here than it is in the desert. I love, I find the desert absolutely amazing and gorgeous. Um, but there's a whole new, uh, a whole new way of gardening here. And I was living on a farm at the time that I made this and um, the seeds themselves are so beautiful. And that so when I started my own plants for the first time ever, you know, you get like a gazillion seeds in this tiny little packet. And I was like, this is so cool. And when they come up to me, it was like magic, you know, this tiny little seed sprouts this beautiful plant and then it releases more seeds. And it really talked about the, you know, the cycle of life. My work is always, um, a dialogue or a comment on my internal landscape. So the pieces that I make, whether I know it or not, 
are speaking about what's happening to me internally, more on a psychological level, an emotional level, um, a spiritual level. And so this was also at a time when I started to learn about quantum physics and the power of the mind and thoughts and how it all matters and how we're all connected. And to me, the seeds are also, um, to me, they're also like thoughts. Like we have this little, this little seed, this little thought, and you can plant it and you can grow something um, and how you nurture that you know, the, the plants need certain things to grow and, and flourish, as do we as individuals. Um, and, you know, a lot of times we're focused on the end product of something um, and don't give a ton of thought on the, you know, what it takes to get to that end product. And the seeds, you know, it's kind of an homage to how beautiful these seeds are that we don't see. We tuck them in the earth and they work their magic, you know, and science, and this beautiful plant that either provides flowers that nourish our soul, or flowers and fruit and vegetables that nourish our body. So it's kind of this combination of um, just what we have at our fingertips. Um, so I made each cap on here. So each, it's a copper, I made all the caps out of copper. Um, and normally I don't use text in my work, but I did for me to learn because I really was also at the beginning of my learning stage about what plant, you know, what seeds to what plants and just plants in general um, of this area. So I stamped on each cap um, what that plant was. So it's, I don't know that it's easy to see that in these images. But this, this is also about, you know, what we consider beautiful. You know, I work with all kinds of different materials, seeds, uh, teeth. I've worked with horse teeth. Um, I've worked with diamonds. Like, it's just, it's also a statement on what is beautiful. And we have so much more uh, beauty than kind of what's prescribed. And that was also, you know, it was comment on, on how beautiful these seeds were and our, uh, our conceptual nature of what beauty is. And then um, the spacers are all tubing that I uh, cut like beads and then used um, a cutting disc to create, you know, some decorative elements on there. And then actually the leather that's holding it all together is sewing machine leather from an old sewing machine. So it's really thick leather. And then the next uh, image is piece of, two necklaces that I made for this show also for the, you know, for sale. And those are rose petals and lavender. So again, you know, it's, it's, they're such a gorgeous color. They're beautiful. They have their own properties. You know, rose has its own energetic property. So does lavender, they're medicinal. Um, so it really just opens up the concept of what what beautiful is and what is, you know, a different way to connect to our earth, to each other. Um, and then the next, so these are all in silver, silver caps, and then I make all the chains. This is a funny story. I um, have a storefront here in Spring Green. And I had this, this couple had come in prior and he had actually seen that necklace, the seed necklace. And he walked in, they, you know, they did, they pur purchased something different. He, they left and he snuck back in and asked if I could make one specifically to give to his beloved. And the Wisconsin river is one of their, you know, their power places, their special places. So this was in cold weather. I think it was, I want to say it was March when there's still, you know, the Wisconsin River is still somewhat frozen on the edges. And so he trekked down and gathered this sand because that was an important place for them. So this one holds sand from the Wisconsin River. I like that, how you had mentioned in an a interview that I saw about how things like this that you find in the mm -hmm. personal history and their story make them perfect for 
you to use in jewelry or to use as an adornment just because of the the story that they bring yeah it extends that you know it's a it's a memorial or memoriam to you know whoever is asking for the piece it's just a different you know we have pretty standard ideas of you know a wedding ring or you know down the line um but it's it's fun to really broaden the spectrum of that and and, and actually connect with people that get it and then do things like this, you know, bring sand in or, you know, whatever the case may be. And you also mentioned about how technical skill is so important. Do you think that adds to the acceptance of- Oh, sure, definitely. kind of materials? I do. I think if it was, done in a different way um it wouldn't be as accepted i think that that the quality of craft is the only way or very high on the list um for it to 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 be accepted yeah yeah it's very important i think we see that in everybody's work in the exhibition and the three all three of you so have this high you know expectation of skill mm -hmm. and even though you know like they may have this you may see the marks like this yeah. that's all intentional but it's yeah. the skill of putting it together is still yeah very high i leave marks intentionally so that is done with a ball peen hammer but i have you know it's a steel block that i do a lot of hammering in and just over the years there are holes in it and that ends up being in the design as well in the texture but to me that texture is so important because it shows that it's a human that made it and not a machine and there's you know all that history um so to me it just makes the piece all the more profound but if i couldn't make clean lines or clean solder marks or you know have those the fine edges around those marks then it would you know that would just look like mistakes so I have a practice where I really, I have an idea, a very specific idea of what the piece will look like. I don't sketch out typically unless it's custom work, but even in custom work, I follow the guidance of the materials. My, my bench is full of bits and pieces and oftentimes, you know, something will jump out at me or something will happen with the piece and it's not a happy accident, although I guess it could kind of be described as that, but it's like there's, there's, there's a different pull that I'm drawn to when I'm creating something. But again, if I didn't have the, the techniques, it wouldn't register the same way. It would look, you know, more like a novice, I guess. Right, yep, yeah. very good. Thank you, Allie. You're welcome. Let's see if Linda, Linda, are oh, you available to talk about your spoons? Yeah, I have no idea what you're going to look at. So I'm just going to aim this right. cell phone at you stuff haven't. and talk through it. See this bar? This is, this is the bar that I've made my long spoons out of, like this guy. This guy came from that quarter inch by quarter inch bar that was probably four inches long. And I use a lot of scrap stuff. The copper wire in this guy, I got involved with fibulas for a while. And the copper wire there came from the telephone company when they were taking down some poles. And the aluminum in here is what I was chasing. And that's probably from a sardine can. And the eyeballs are just glass and I didn't know how to set them. So I just wrapped this, I pounded the copper bar out so I could wrap it around the eyeballs and it's just being held in there by pressure. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, this is, I did a bunch of fibulas. They kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is, oh, I think I got three left. This is the most elaborate one and it's really cool to wear at parties. Um, aluminum. This is some of the aluminum I use. And I have a whole bunch someplace. I had it and I put it someplace and I have no idea where it is right now. Sterling, I'm moving back into sterling. There's a couple of sterling spoons in the show. These are new spoons that I've made. So here's one. This one's in the works. You have got a picture of this one in the pitch. 
and um, I'm going to finish it and then it'll be up on the internet on my website. I don't have a website. I do have a website, but it's the blog. I put most everything on there. Um, here's aluminum and copper. I'm trying to learn how to set stuff. I have trouble making something permanent, so I always make my stuff so it can be removed and used someplace else. And I got involved with these barrettes. So I've been, this is for a barrette, the rocket. It's also aluminum, weighs nothing. This is another rocket for a barrette. Um, the spoons, I started doing spoons. I don't know why, I just started pounding on metal. Um, no idea what I was doing. I sort of can feel my way through it. Here, these are spoons that I've done. This rooster's not finished, almost finished, not quite finished. Here's a squirrel with a coffee cup. And the bottom, I haven't even started doing the spoon bowl yet, but he's getting close. Here's a naked man um, eating a red herring. I've got a thing about red herring. Where's the rocket? Here's the rocket. And this is, I like these. And it's funny, as soon as you get the bowl part pounded out and you drop it, it sounds like a piece of silverware. I mean, the acoustics to one of these things is very cool. Um, I'm doing it just because I can. I, there's no other reason for it. I, I'll do this for a while. And if I start getting too good at it, it's time to back up. I don't want to get me involved. I, the art's got to come by itself. And so I'll go paint. And I start painting instead of doing the metal work when I feel that I've, uh, the painting is going to be a little scary. And I'll do something else instead of the metal work until I start worrying about, am I forgetting the metal work? Am I forgetting how to do this? So I sort of go back and forth on that. Um, I just like it. It's for no other reason than it's, it makes me happy. Oh, every one of these things is a self-portrait. My screaming ladies, the guys that are upset, um, all of them. That's the only way I can do it. I pound who I am, what I'm feeling. Um, all of that is in there that I don't ever have to take anything bad to bed with me that way. So all of these things. Um, yeah, here's a weird snake. I don't remember what I was thinking about at that time. This guy's good. Can you see it? You know, anybody that's watching, if they want to really see stuff better, because I'm not doing a very good job with this, um, send me an email. I'll hook up with you. I'll show you stuff on um, well, with emails or the blog. Linda, I'm going to go back to your images. I'm going to share my screen again, and then I'm going to go back to some of the images of your work in the exhibition, and everybody can see those, and then we can just talk through it. That's, that's good, because that I gave you a lot of step-by-steps to get to an end result. Yeah, so right now I've got your sardine spoon, and the pig spoon, and the rooster spoon up, but the, I like the pig spoon and the, and the um, sardine spoon, and I like the holders for that. You make all of your holders custom. For each well, spoon. you know why? Because if otherwise, you they're going to get lost in the silverware drawer. So I thought, no, this, they're going to be used for special things. You know, maybe the little ones for the babies, the bigger ones for olives. And so you don't lose them. And they're pretty cool. They're really nice to hold. So they do a lot of different things. If you lose your taste, you can still have a nice spoon to look at. If you go blind, it'll feel real good in your hands because I make sure that it's all real smooth and tactile. Um, they're, they're going to be very small. I mean, some of the small ones will fit in your pocket when it's time to move to Mars. So there's all of these fine little details I think about and that got involved with the rockets because they represent escape. And I like that. And I've been involved with rockets a lot earlier than, you know, people now talking about going to Mars. I've been involved with rockets because it was an escape mechanism and it gets you from one bad place to another better place, hopefully. Um, what else have I got that I can show? I do normal things. Here's like, a, I do like, here's a nice little house, little building, you know, so I'm not just completely off the wall and I make my own pin backs for that. Great. Do you want to talk about this 
process real quick? Oh, okay. These guys, this is, I cut out, instead of using bar metal, which I really do like doing, I'm decided I have to do things a little bit more according to Hoyle. So I cut it out, sort of the basic shape of the spoon. Um, the next one you'll see I have, not so much with this one, but the owl spoon, I have a basic shape of the uh, spoon that I use. And that's what I want because I'm pounding it out. I'm, I don't have a rolling mill to make it really flat. So I'm doing it by hand with heavy hammers. And so it goes off a little wobbly, but that's okay. I'll make something out of it. It's not, I'm not, uh, because it doesn't go according to what the idea is, that doesn't mean I'm going to throw it away. Um, I have a good time with it. It's, I'm always surprising myself. So what this is, this one was cut, the metal was cut for this spoon oh, a couple of years ago. I had a piece of scrap sterling. So I drew this thing out. And it's, this is step by step. It, you, know, you pound on it, you kneel it, and then I took a picture. You pound it on it some more, and then you take another picture. I mean, every time you pound on it and it compresses the metal and it won't move anymore, then you have to anneal it with a torch to soften the molecules and they all sort of relax and spread out, then you can take a hammer to it again. Then you pound it until the molecules get really pushed together. Then you have to anneal it, which is heat that makes the molecules just relax again. And if you, I had to learn because after working copper, which is like butter and aluminum, which is like nothing, um, with the sterling, I've gone too fast and it doesn't like going fast. It doesn't want to be pushed, so it will crack. And if you crack the sterling and you keep pounding on it, you ignore that crack, it's going to crack more and you have to cut it out and redo it. So I've managed to calm myself down. I can anneal it, oh, probably two or three times more often than I would with aluminum because right now I'm just really afraid of cracking the of cracking the sterling. So it takes a lot longer, it's a lot harder, but it's very pretty to work on on the on the pitch. It's much more pretty it's prettier than the aluminum. And it's really fun when you finally get it all sort of detailed and then you can put a little liver of sulfur on it. You sort of doctor it up and the deep the deep bends and the deep little cuts and and dents that holds some of the darkness and when you take steel wool to it and brush it up you can see what you've got and that's a like major surprise that's part of the art for me is the surprise it's just if it was so much fun to do for the first one then you go and do it the next time and then you have two if you do a third one then you have a set um and this set of pictures goes all the way oh here you got the uh the, owl. the owl up yep yeah okay this was good i did this on purpose um, I pounded it, annealed it, put it in the pickle, wiped it off, put it back in the pitch, and this has been it. And every time when I had to wait for it to be pickled, I had to draw on some other, some other stuff. So it was like one thing after the other. And that last one over there on the right, that's the owl. That's, I put a little bit of liver of sulfur on it so you could see really what I was getting. And right now I'm getting ready to actually roll the edges into the back. It's only four inches tall. Um, I do like turning the middle part into a tube because it gives it a whole lot more strength. I got a, I've got some kind of an internal system that understands how to make things stronger. I couldn't explain to you. You just sort of have to do it trial and error, and I think that's probably how I figured things out. Um, I did go to MATC, the downtown campus in Madison, um, to learn how to solder. Um, the people at Haystack saw some of the stuff I did and they said I should go to the school because there's this woman there that's a really good teacher. And I become friends with her and I got a lot of her stuff in my studio right now or in the garage. And she taught me how to solder and I picked up a lot of stuff from a lot of the people there. And now I really miss the class, but I'm doing okay. I got a book, couple of books that I read when I get stuck and I can always go over and ask Allie. She says I could. So, and Allie's really good. She knows what she's doing. I sort of go by the seat of my pants. Um, 
Yeah, but this owl is cool. So I'm going to make a whole bunch of small spoons uh, for little babies. I got a friend that's having, they're actually one daughter and one son. They're actually going to be having babies. So that's two spoons. And um, yeah, this is going to be cool. I'm excited about this. I just like doing stuff because it surprises me. And it's sure going to surprise them. Oh, the egg spoon. That long one in the show. Yeah. I really wanted an egg spoon because when I, I eat it. eggs out of the shell, so then I don't have to wash any dishes, and the spoons are always too big. So I made myself, there it is, made myself my yes. own little egg spoon. It's a little stiff, it's a little straight, but it works just fine. And this little owl spoon, it's going to work real well as an egg spoon too. Um, I have a ball. I absolutely love what I do. And I mean, I've got more stuff here. I mean, there's here, here's another sardine can. This, can you see this? Yep. yep okay, this one, I threw a bunch of stuff out so I don't have a bottom for it. So I'm gonna have to make a box for it. And I made a box for the last one that I threw the bottom out. I was in one of those moods and you just clean up and throw everything out. And I didn't think anybody wanted any sardine cans. And all of a sudden, all you have to do is throw them out and everybody wants them. So I had to come up with a bottom for the top part, the guy wanted the top part and I didn't have a bottom. So I put it on a board. Next thing you know, I had four sides and the bottom to that. And I learned how to make hinges. So I started making hinges. Out of, I don't have any hinges here. I made hinges out of um, olive oil tins because they've got nice colors on them with the enamel. And so now I can make hinges. Um, hey, Linda, I have a question for you. Somebody wants to know when the work is in the pitch, are you using little punches pounding the front side or the back? Well, it's you pound the front side and then you turn it over and then you pound the back. But you have to you sort of, I use mineral oil um, just on a cotton ball and that keeps it so it doesn't get completely stuck in the pitch. And then when you're done with it and you can feel, you can really feel when the metal isn't going to move anymore. You know, and you have to sort of keep moving the tools. So you're, you work the metal just like you would work clay. That's it. You make your tools so they look like little fingers. And that's what you use. Like if you were going to be moving clay, it works the exact same way. There is no magic to it. It's just the metal is going to be harder. Um, yeah, so you work on one side, then you work on the other side, and you keep flipping it back and forth until you get one side that looks like what you want it to look like. And yes, the metal has its own opinion and its own idea of what it's going to let you do. So you have to find that happy medium. And I'm learning that. I was away from sterling for, I don't know, not a year. I did those other, I did some of those that are in the show last summer. So that's not that far away. And um, yeah, you just, you push it, you're moving it, you're not bending it, you're, you, you are moving the molecules from one to the other, from one place to the other, and you're making it thinner when you're moving it, you're making, taking the metal from one spot and pushing it over into another spot. So you can actually make the metal thicker in one spot. In spoons, you can, you can move the metal up and down and turn it, push it all the way into the center part if you want, or you can thin it out so it's really, really thin. Then you can turn it into a tube. Um, it's, it's very cool. It's really, really fun. I don't make jewelry. I don't wear a lot of jewelry. I've made a couple of bracelets because I needed a bracelet. And I made a couple of pendants because I had this really great screaming lady. I think I, I can probably go get it. I'm just going to take you with me. Um, yeah, I, it's my mood. It's whatever is in my head is going to come out my hands. And I really believe that's what happens. Where is it? Here it is. Yeah, I like that quote. You say that quote. Whatever's in but your head comes true. out your hands. I mean, did you ever try writing a letter when you're in a bad mood? People don't write letters anymore on paper, but you would wind up bad mood. You, you, you start pushing hard on the paper. It's going to be the pencil is going to be heavier. Um, in your happy mood, it's you, your lines go up. You're, if you don't have to draw on something, or write on something with straight lines, your writing will sort of swing up to the top. That's so. Th whatever you are is going to come out your hands or your voice. You know. Here, look. See this? Can you see that one? Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, we can see that. I can that share lady, my screen. On, I wear this when I'm really upset with stuff. There you go. It sort of speaks for me, so I don't have to make any comments about things. Um, I got a bunch of those too. Well, um, Linda, Linda, we're getting close to our time, and I want okay. to include Darlis and, and Allie and some of our final thoughts. And you've brought up, you've been so productive lately, and I'm wondering. Has the pandemic, work during the pandemic, been affected? Has it affected your motivation? Has it affected your productivity? Darlis and Allie, if you wanna jump in. I've actually been quite productive because I had so much time that I couldn't go anywhere. And so my studio is in my basement and um, um, it was nice to kind of have uninterrupted time. Um, and I'm working on a series now, uh, a new series kind of as a result of, of the pandemic. And uh, it's all about um, uh, broken steps and fragile ladders, how things sort of, you know, you think you're going one way and things change. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's been difficult, but I'm, you know, just trying to kind of work through it. Are those wall pieces that you're working on? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Allie, what about you? Sure. I uh, went to more online. You know, I developed, I had a way you know, uploaded and things that I've made um, that are coming through me for who knows who. Um, but what I've noticed is that I have really started to take a lot more custom work. Um, individuals, I think are, I think what COVID has done in the quarantine has really helped people focus on what they really want in their life. And I have coined a line of jewelry called transformational adornments that I really am making pieces to empower the individual. Again, jewelry has been a form of, uh, a form of communication throughout the ages. And I guess for me, I really want to communicate an individual's personal power so that when they wear that, they're really like, you know, they're activating that within themselves. So the custom work that I've been doing is, is really kind of centered around that. Um, whether the person knows it or not, that's kind of where I come from. Um, but definitely much more custom work uh, since COVID started, which is great. I um, hadn't done custom work that much previously, but I really love getting to know the individual and connecting with them in that way. Again, because they are choosing to buy something for themselves for you know whatever the reason, but when they wear that, it's really um, empowering them in whatever way it is for them uniquely. And uh, I, I really see that path just beginning. I like how that's inspirational and positive that you've gone yeah. that way. I, I think that you know if we're gonna if we're gonna move forward in a positive way, I really do believe that each and every one of us, if we're activating our highest potential, then we can cut through a lot of this dense energy that we've got going on. And we're not really taught to believe in ourselves in a really you know in a profound way, especially women. So my work is really about empowering women even though there are men that i create for as well but i you know i really want everyone to step up and step into their full potential because you know it's time <laughs> and so if i can make something that connects with that individual and each person has something they're specifically wanting to accentuate and so it's it's another way for me to connect with someone and then connect them to herself, you know, just be a catalyst. It's not like I'm doing it for them, but it's a, it's a vehicle for that. Yep. And Linda? Oh, I had, starting in December, we've had serious family problems, health-wise. And it actually, I mean, I caught myself just frozen in my tracks in the studio. And it was when you guys asked me to participate in this exhibition. I had to make spoon holders 
And I, that's what I started to do. And that forced me into paying attention and get me centered. And after that, I've been up and running ever since. So in the, you know, isolation, solitude, that, that doesn't bother me. You know, I, I do miss giving somebody a hug when I run into them, at, you know, if, if I went to the post office or something, you know, seeing them at the gas station. But other than that, I'm doing, after those first couple of months and I started making the spoon holders, I'm, I'm fine. I'm doing, I started drawing pictures though. I needed to calm down. I've been doing portraits of trees and how it's going to show up in metal, I'm not sure, but that's what I do in the meantime. So I'm, I'll pound on the metal and then I'll go out and draw. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm turning into a happy camper right now. I don't like the virus, but you know, what are you going to do? Right, right. Well, it, it's time to wrap up, but I, I've seen, Linda, I've seen your work, some of the work, things you're working on, your drawings on social yeah. media. Would, would you start us off just to, to end? Um, where's the best place to, for people to keep up with you online to, to find out what you're working on and just keep up with your work and with what you're uh, doing? Lynn, I do a pretty good job of posting on um, Linda Kellen dash artings, A-R-T-I-N-G-S dot blogspot. I'm easy to find. Um, I'm on Facebook. I've got a couple of, I've got, now it's sort of a lot of, uh, you know, in the back there's folders and you can just sort of look at one thing after the other. I've got paintings, I've got chased things, I've got drawings, I've got, ah, a whole bunch of stuff. I carved this giant paddlefish just because I thought I could. It was like carving a giant bar of soap. Um, and it's, that thing is 10 years old now, but all the step-by-step -step for that is in Facebook too. Contact me. Let yep. me know what you're looking at or looking for, and I'll get you in the right stuff. And then the rest of it, you're on your own. Right. So your blog online and, and Facebook for sure. Um, Darlis yeah. or Allie? Yeah. I have um, the easiest way, I think, is to go on Instagram or Facebook. Allie Kaus. I think if you punch in my name, one of those or all of those will come up. Instagram and Facebook, I post almost every day all of my recent works. I do have a website, alleycouseadornment.com, where you can go to and look at more of my work. But the most recent work and the, the things that are on the bench currently are Instagram and Facebook. So at my name. Great. And Darlis? Uh, same thing. Uh, I've been using Instagram more. So it's my name, darlis.evault. Um, and I do have a website too, but I have been posting things in progress and some of the most uh, recent things, mostly on Instagram. Great, great. Thank you all. Thank you, Darlis. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, Linda, for being part of this talk. I hope everyone enjoyed it today. Um, if you value this type of programming, please consider supporting the museum financially through the donate button at dbqart.org. We will be bringing another one of these talks to you in two weeks, a craft related talk. Follow the museum also on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and through our weekly e-news to keep up with all future programming that you can participate in. And for now, be well and goodbye. We'll see you next time.